John Florence is an embodiment of much that is good about Leicester. If asked to state his occupation, he would probably say radio presenter. And that role for BBC Radio Leicester and for radios two and four is certainly his most audible presence in the city. He has, in his time, presented most of the programmes on BBC Radio Leicester, but is most clearly associated with the, with the station's mid-morning programme, which he hosted for many years. John's guests once included a young man who claimed to have invented a new kind of vacuum cleaner. John was, of course, polite, as he always is, but his considered view was that the young man was going nowhere fast. The man's name was James Dyson. Now, some of the best conversations, John observes, take place immediately after the interviews. Kenneth Clark, for example, waved away his officials at the end of an interview because he wanted to talk to John about a Radio 4 programme that John had made about Ronnie Scott. Similarly, Roy Hattersley stayed on because he wanted to talk to John about Philip Larkin. John's best-known interview was with John Major, the interview led the BBC One Evening News and gained a tribute from the Daily Express, which declared John to be Radio Leicester's Jeremy Paxman. After the interview, it became apparent that the Prime Minister's mind had been elsewhere because he plaintively asked John to turn on the television so that he could ascertain the test score. Now, many of John's guests were local people, including members of this university. On one occasion, he interviewed Sue Townsend before any of the Adrian Mall books had been published. They became friends, and eventually John appeared in one of her books, Adrian Mall and the Weapons of Mass Destruction, in which he interviews Adrian about Pandora Braithwaite on Radio Leicester. This presence in literature has, John is convinced, assured his immortality. Now, John has been deeply moved by the integrity of many of those he has interviewed, notably the two heroes of South Africa, Albie Sachs and Desmond Tutu. He has enjoyed the celebrities, but characteristically, he takes the greatest satisfaction from his interviews with ordinary people in difficult circumstances. People who were dying with great courage, people whose families were ripped apart because of drug dependency, people who have been victims of prejudice and bigotry, who have been prey to crippling diseases, who have lived decently in poverty. He is moved by the resilience of ordinary people, conceding that there are ne'er-do-wells and scoundrels, as there always have been, but insisting that if we identify human nature with their example, we are not being realistic about the generality of people and their qualities. Now, the long association of John Florence with radio broadcasting is so strong that earlier parts of his life have slipped from popular memory. He is, like many citizens of Leicester, not a native. He's a Londoner who was educated in Wales, where he took a PhD in English literature and drama. He came to Leicester as an English teacher at Queen Elizabeth and Wigiston College, which adjoins our campus. When he moved into broadcasting, he took with him his literary and dramatic interests. He was, for example, for many years a theatre critic on Radio 4's Kaleidoscope, for which he reviewed Stratford and Leicester productions. He's now president of the Shires branch of the Betjeman Society and an active member of the Larkin Society and the Houseman Society. With those interests, perhaps inevitably, he is also an enthusiast for steam trains. Beyond the world of literature and drama, John Florence's principal artistic interest is music. He's president of the Lester Gilbert and Sullivan Society and a committed member of the London Wagner Society. His most visible presence in the world of music is a long series of pre-concert talks and interviews that he has done, often on this stage, for the Philharmonia Orchestra, the Bardi Orchestra, and the International Music Festival. John Florence's citizenship of this city takes many forms. He's a prominent supporter of local charities for whom he cuts ribbons and gives finely tuned after-dinner speeches. He's a warden at Leicester Cathedral. He often teaches adults, both for the Workers' Educational Association and for this university in our Richard Attenborough Center, where he's offered courses on both literature and music. 
When he served as president of the Leicester Literary and Philosophical Society, he lectured on why opera matters. John Florence is not primarily a print journalist, but he has for many years written a regular opinion column for the Leicester Mercury. One column in particular captures an important reason for his importance to this city. He begins by observing that Leicester is the most culturally diverse city in the country and acknowledges that migration brings challenges about the way we all live together. He then tells the story of a visit to a restaurant. It was early evening and a group of six young women came in all done up in their party bests. There were two South Asians, a Chinese and three white teenagers and they were out celebrating the 16th birthday of one of their number. All were around that age, full of life, their faces animated with enjoyment and pleasure in each other's company. John observed to his wife, Jennifer, who is here today, that it was a wonderful sight, friends from three different backgrounds out together. Yes, she whispered back, but the really wonderful thing is that they don't think there's anything wonderful about it at all. She was, John says, absolutely right. These young women were, as it were, colorblind, simply a bunch of friends who enjoyed being together. The column concluded with the observation that their fellowship, to use an old biblical word, offered a fragile but very real hope for the future of our cities, for the future of all of us. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, on the authority of the Senate and the Council, I present to you John Florence that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Laws. I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws and welcome you among us. Many congratulations. Well, needless to say, I'm very humbled by the great, great honour the university does me today, although I must say I hardly recognise the gentleman who figured in the oration by my old friend Professor Campbell. I can only hope that in the future I can live up to his overwhelming description of my qualities, most of which I was quite unaware I possessed. <laughs> Today, as has already been said, is one of rejoicing and satisfaction in achievement. And I dare say you'd like me to get on, you'd like to get on with the celebrations rather than listen to some old grey beard you've never heard of chuntering away up here. Well, all I can say is hard luck because I've never had the opportunity to do this, and I'm going to take it with both hands. I said that today is one of celebration after years of hard work, but I rather suspect that what your education actually means, how it shaped you, will only become apparent to you in the years to come. In these days of measurable outcomes and judgment by objective results, Education is too often rather depressingly seen simply as a way into the job market, a set of obstacles over which to get a relatively unproblematic process of transferring skills, facts and knowledge. That this is not entirely the case came clear to me only a few weeks back when I heard that my old English teacher, Mr Hyde, had died. I can't tell you how much that news affected me, and it set me thinking about the profound effect that he'd had on me. Not that I can remember much about what he had actually taught me about the texts we studied. No, what I remembered is his enthusiasm, his humour, the interest he took in each of his students. One day, knowing that I like classical music, he slipped a ticket into my hand and said, you'll enjoy this. It was for a performance of Verdi's Otello at Covent Garden. He was a gifted play director and actor, and he produced a play every term at school. I was a member of the stage crew, and one evening after a late rehearsal, he simply said, come on, lads, I'll buy you a drink. It was the first time I'd ever set foot in a pub, and I think that was true for most of us. It was a real rite of passage. You couldn't get away with it today. 
I had no thought of going to university, but he persuaded me I should. He spoke to mum and dad and helped me select a university in 101 ways, although I had no sense of this at the time, and for many years afterwards, he was helping to make me, for better or worse, what I am. And that's how important real education is. Real teachers awaken the worm of curiosity, which all of us possess, and so they change lives. And this can happen at any stage in life. I know this because my wife graduated only last year on this stage, having taken a degree at the university's Vaughan College. A university should not just be about young people, it should be about education for all, no matter what stage of life they have reached. The 19th century philosopher John Stuart Mill wrote, the object of universities is to make cultivated human beings. I'd also like to say that education should aim to stimulate your critical intelligence. Given the ubiquity of modern media and the ease of electronic communications, it's more than ever important that you approach the world critically and with scepticism. And scepticism is not cynicism, that modern and pervasive sin which prevents proper thought and understanding and turns us into sour and small-minded individuals. So when the Secretary of State for Education, on the one hand, rightly lauds the uniquely expressive language of the authorised version of the Bible, but on the other hand praises as a great man Rupert Murdoch, someone who has corrupted understanding by debasing the public language of journalism, well, I can only conclude that Mr Gove is, how can I put this, confused? Perhaps if he had attended this great university, rather than a lesser institution like Oxford University, he might be able to think more logically. We need, as I have said, a critical and informed and intelligent scepticism when confronted with this sort of thing. We come back to education. Enjoy your sense of achievement. Take pleasure in it. In the years to come, what your education means for you, how it has shaped you, will, I hope, finally become clear. And your sense of thankfulness and gratitude to your teachers and to your parents will be the greater. Massive congratulations to you all. Enjoy yourselves and enjoy your future lives. <laughs>